Good afternoon. Welcome, everyone. I'm Gloria Kenyon, Public Programs Coordinator here at the Smithsonian American Art Museum. I am delighted to welcome you today to Objects USA at 50, a part of the occasional series, A Closer Look. Today's program will explore and discuss Objects USA, the expansive craft exhibition which premiered in this building 50 years ago. Before I introduce our speakers, a few housekeeping notes. Please silence your cell phones. If you must take a call, please take it to the lobby before answering. Please do not take photographs during the program. To start our day, it is my pleasure to interview Paul Smith, who co-curated Objects USA with Lee Nordness. Following our conversation, we will hear from Janet Koplos, then Roseanne Summerson. We will then have a brief break and resume with a conversation exploring the terms objects in USA, when what they meant then and now, with Glenn Adamson, Tanya Aguanigua, and Sarah Archer. After their conversation at approximately 5.45, not 5.15, as in, your, as in your program, we will have a question and answer session with all presenters. Please submit your questions via the card in your program, and they will be collected by a program staff member. I also direct your attention to our printed program where you'll find more information about each of today's speakers. We then invite you to join us for a small reception in the lobby after the program to continue the discussion that we are starting this afternoon on stage. Today for me, personally, is a continuation of a conversation I started in graduate school almost a decade ago as I began my research for my master's thesis on Objects USA and its cultural impact. I look forward to sharing a look back at this stunning exhibition and exploring the relevance it still has today. I'm grateful to our speakers today for sharing their time and expertise with us. And I would especially like to thank Mrs. Thelma Lincoln for her generous support of the Closer Look programs, the Lincoln Education Endowment. And now we will get started with a conversation with Paul Smith. Please join me in welcoming Paul to the stage. Welcome, Paul. Thank you. Before we begin, I would like to note that all of the works and objects you see behind us are now found in the collection of the Museum of Art and Design in New York. Paul, as co-curator of the show Objects USA, can you please give us a brief overview of the show and how you became involved? Well, uh, first of all, I want to thank you for organizing uh, this event because I think the 50th anniversary is a worthy time to, to do it. And for me, it's uh, personal because um, I was involved uh, with the forming of the collection, which I will explain a bit. But, and I was here in this building near 50, year ago, 50 years ago on October 2nd, 1969, for the premiere opening. <laughs> so it's very interesting uh, to think back to that time and also uh, to be here today to reflect on what is now history of the, uh, in the 20th century. Uh, to begin, uh, I want to state that Lee Nordness, who had a gallery in New York that opened in 1958, really deserves the credit for the concept and really this project being realized. He's no longer with us, unfortunately, but uh, it's really important that he be credited and that um, he also, Johnson Wax, the corporation as a sponsor was very, very important because it was such a major undertaking. And just a little history here. Um, Lee was very enterprising. He um, went far beyond his gallery walls, as I understand, in the beginning days by having exhibits elsewhere. And from what I have read, he was uh, invited by the Johnson Foundation in Racine to give a, uh, to do a small show and give a lecture. And that's where he met 
Herbert Fitz Johnson, the CEO at the time, and his wife Irene, who were collectors, and I think they were also very involved with commissioning Frank Lloyd Wright to do a lot of the buildings. So there was a history there of connection to the arts that was uh, important. But out of that came a, the idea of uh, Johnson Wax doing a major collection called Art USA that actually was launched in 1962. It was a mammoth uh, collection of American painting uh, that traveled extensively. So uh, that was a, a kind of a preliminary uh, phase of Objects USA because uh, Lee then having a good connection with Johnson Wax um, approached them about an idea of a show dealing with artists in the craft media. Uh, and um, that I think that Lee was always very, very um, uh, interested in the breadth of the arts in general, the visual arts. And I know, from what I understand, he also had collected modestly in the early days of buying works at America House, which was a marketing outlet for the American Craftsman's Council and also began to uh, show some of the artists in these exhibitions. So there was a history there, and I don't know the exact date of when it happened, but it was certainly, a, for at least I expect about two years before it, this show was realized, or launched here, that he invited me to lunch one day and said that he had the interest of doing a sequel exhibition. Would I be, could I be involved because he knew what he didn't know, that he knew the resources of, of the American Craftsman's Council, now the American Craft Council. And um, also, um, he, uh, I was uh, then director of what was the Museum of Canterbury Crafts, now MAD. So um, the offer was uh, very simple. Uh, of uh, Any expenses would be covered, uh, a small stipend uh, grant to the uh, American Craftsman's Council, and uh, the biggest uh, uh, offer was that as Johnson Wax would be acquiring the works uh, to, to help the artists, uh, it was the idea behind it, but also that they would donate the works to permanent collections. Now that happened with Art USA as well. So um, uh, if I were, would become involved, I would have first choice of a third of the collection. <laughs> so, needless to say, <laughs> that was very tempting. However, um, I uh, saw it as something, as a, a major project that was far beyond the scope of what ACC was doing. And, uh, and so, uh, after consulting with some of my colleagues at the organization, I accepted quickly and we moved forward. Fantastic. Um, also, just so wonderful to get the first choice. Um, <laughs> Matt does have, a, as we can see behind us, a great collection. Um, so you mentioned that Lee had a good understanding of what he didn't know and asked you to help him um, determine what would be yeah. good in building this. How was the collection of work determined and how did you d um, distill down your curatorial focus? I will try to simplify it <laughs> because it was a very big project. <clears throat> um, we began uh, quickly by what I would call very aggressive research. With the artist files and information on a lot of the artists, we were able to um, compile a list because we had addresses and contact information of some of the known makers around the country. So the first stage was writing letters to these artists and asking for uh, slides or photographs. It was pre-internet. There were few, very few galleries. There were no events like SOFA where one could go and see a vast amount of material. So it really was pioneering time to, to, um, uh, to collect material. And uh, so letters were sent uh, to the, uh, these artists and then we would have review sessions. But it was also realized that uh, on the spot travel was required. And so uh, there were several trips planned. Um, the press release that the 
time of the opening states that there was 14,000 miles of research travel. I can't verify that, <laughs> but uh, I, uh, I did go on many trips uh, to the northeast, the southeast. We went and made a trip to the west coast. We went to, uh, not even on to Hawaii, because we wanted to represent the whole United States. And so um, it was a very, um, uh, um, um, as I said before, a kind of a rapid and focused uh, research phase of, of in a short time. For these trips, <clears throat> we would do research and uh, we would target an area like in New England where they're around Boston and the New England area and uh, went to the New Hampshire League. And uh, so in each place we would uh, plan to make contact with organizations uh, and um, that had background and information as well as schools. Schools were a very important contact because that was a point where departments and ceramics and uh, 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 glass began to emerge as well as fiber uh, coming out of home economics were then in art uh, school programs and university art programs. So uh, our contact with the faculty was a first step as they were often candidates. And then we benefited from there, uh, informing us of um, emerging talent, often graduate students. Uh, and so um, we benefit from that. We would visit um, artist studios and whatever was in that, in that area. We couldn't, of course, cover every very single uh, location, but it was, uh, it was a very extensive uh, uh, phase and I think was very important in the final result. Yes, and um, before I get to, because it was such an extensive collection and our slideshow is not quite working properly, I'm gonna fix that so folks can see all these amazing works. Um, Okay, they should be running through properly now, but um, thank you for your patience. Um, so I would love for you to mention how many works there were because there were just so many, um, and I think that's one of the most fascinating things. And well, then um, after we get that fun fact, um, what was the public's response to this? You mentioned this is pioneering and there weren't few galleries, but there weren't that many galleries at the time. So how did the public respond to seeing this, some folks for the first time, and then what was also the press response upon yeah, seeing this? Yeah. Well, there were, um, at least my account was 358 artists and uh, 308, I have that wrong, I, it was, yeah, 380 works <laughs> and 380 artists because there were a few artists that had two or in a couple cases, three works. <clears throat> so um, I just want to add before I talk about the response that uh, uh, one other aspect of our curatorial um, work was I think from the very beginning there was no formula or rule or saying we have to do this or do that. It was very open. <laughs> so the exhibition uh, evolved out of the research project. And um, I think Lee and I were both on the same wavelength. He certainly had the idea of a survey exhibition that, um, and I certainly understood that uh, as an important focus. Uh, and I think that it was, uh, Art USA I think set a precedent for uh, establishing what Objects USA could be. Uh, I can't say uh, that we, Lee and I ever had any real disagreement. I think we were on the same wavelength, even down to the selection of work when it came to that. Uh, we would discuss work or whatever. And I, the other point that I wanted to make is that my involvement was a, a really one phase of the project. <clears throat> it was an enormous undertaking to do this uh, by, with not only assembling it, creating it, planning the tour, 
supervising it, and Lee and his staff handled all of those aspects, uh, including the publications and documents that were being done. I was, I never had uh, any official title, but I would say I was a, a guest curator or a consulting curator because my main association was with the actual content. That was my background and knowledge, and, uh, but I was often consulted on different areas. I helped with advising on the creating method because I knew about the challenges of creating all these fragile objects, or many of the fragile objects, as well as uh, there are a few installation elements that were created uh, that were part of the show when it opened here. For example, the jewelry installation or whatever. So uh, I was often um, asked about um, details uh, that they were working on, but I would like to make it very clear that I certainly uh, uh, was mainly involved with the selection of, of the content of the exhibition. Now on to your question about the uh, um, press and public response. It was fast. And um, also, um, Johnson Wax was uh, extremely uh, generous uh, in helping in, in many ways. One being that they had um, provided the services of their uh, very distinguished press advertising agency, the Carl Beyer Associates, and they were not involved with every PR activity because they would work with, say, this museum here. But they, they really generated a lot of important press. The week of the opening here, uh, Eileen Saarinen, who was then doing reporting for the NBC Today show, did a, a report. That was great. And then um, when the, there was another aspect uh, in, um, that they were involved with, that they sponsored a one-hour film, uh, highlighting, uh, profiling a few of the artists in depth. It was more, more about the artists with reference to the project. And they bought the airtime on ABC primetime evening. And in uh, 1972, when the collection uh, gift came to the museum, we had an exhibition. And NBC, again, had an interest. And we moved some objects to the studio, uh, uh, Rockefeller Center, not far away. And I was interviewed by Barbara Walters, who actually wanted to buy one of the works. <laughs> And those events in America reached millions of people when you have national TV, you know. Uh, so um, the press was very important. On the European tour, uh, I have a doc press reports that document the coverage and the response and some of the attention. And it was enormous because um, uh, I would say generally, uh, it was extremely well received. It went to 11 uh, cities. And um, I think it, uh, Edinburgh had 53,000 attendees and Warsaw had 24. That was a lot in a short time. But the, the press comments were really great about uh, being very American. Uh, talking about, we haven't seen this aspect of America before. And uh, so I, I, I think that um, it had many uh, kind of branches of influence. Now the um, European tour was officially uh, sponsored by the, or endorsed by the United States Information Agency that also was another status association. Uh, so that was yet another another dimension. So I think that the um, the cumulative press was enormous. It benefited every artist who were, w w was represented in the collection, and I think it it really uh, was just a, a, a very important um, uh, extension of of the exhibit. 
That sounds amazing. And I remember reading hundreds of press clippings when doing my research. Right. So right. Um, Johnson Wax Company knew what they were doing press-wise. So you've mentioned a couple of times the tour. So after it premiered here, it toured throughout the United States, and you mentioned Europe. How did that come about, and how was it facilitated? Well, I'm not sure um, uh, how that evolved, because Lee really handled it. But I would add that um, I think one of the um, the thing is really uh, clearly defined on this, but I think Lee saw this area of, of the emerging art as something that should be part of the fine arts. And he, I think he, in selecting museums, most of the museums, including this one, were fine art museums. <laughs> that was, I think, important as the viewers as well as the staff as well as the um, the people who were connected with it uh, were quite surprised many times about what uh, they saw and i I have no big inventory of response because <laughs> there's so many people involved, but I do have a couple I would like to refer to, one which relates to this institution. When I did an oral interview with Lloyd Herman for the Archives of American Art, this subject came up and it is documented that, Lee, uh, that uh, Lloyd uh, did attend the preview. And as he was then doing uh, exhibitions uh, in other areas of, before the Renwick Open, he had made a proposal uh, and a concept for what the Renwick would, could be. And so, um, and I just confirmed this with him by email the recently to be sure I have this correct. But he, he said that uh, uh, definitely the exhibition uh, certainly uh, in, endorsed uh, the concept that he had proposed about the Renwick being a, uh, a, a design, applied art, and craft museum, which it is, is of course. And then there were other, like when Joan Mondale was the, uh, her husband was vice president, we did a number of things with her. And uh, she said, as you know, she was a potter and very involved with the arts. She said, um, well, I went to see it three times. So I don't know all the stories, but I, I, I do know also that uh, it definitely um, opened the door for or fostered the market in the beginning with galleries and people beginning to collect. There were people who were acquiring work, but they didn't call themselves collectors. <laughs> they had work. And then later, you know, the word collector came into being. And so um, it's hard to summarize the vast response, but I'm just highlighting a few uh, areas that I know from my own um, experience of people speaking to me or talking to me that that it uh, it did have a, a vast uh, a result and I think that <clears throat> for the artists also um, some of the artists were known but there were a lot of artists that were not so it certainly wasn't bad for the resume <laughs> and as we can see behind us there are some that still look very familiar as, to us today um, you've mentioned that um, in the European tour, Fuchs commented that they hadn't seen that aspect of America before. And um, reflecting back on that now, how do you see Objects USA in a historical context? Well, I have a, 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 um, a response um, in my long career. In 1986, I organized uh, a sequel called Craft Today, Poetry of the Physical, which were the, that traveled to the United States and then also traveled to Europe to 15 cities, including some of the cities where Objects USA has been. And um, uh, it was very interesting uh, for me as I was, after I left the museum, I was going to each location for site visits. It also paralleled the Berlin Wall coming down and the opening of the Free Society. It was shown in Warsaw, where it attracted 40,000 people. And um, I think that um, even at that point, even in 86, 
uh, actually it was 88, 89, 90. I mean, it was, it was he premiered in 86 here in New York. Uh, but it was, the tour was uh, for uh, three years after. And uh, I witnessed the response in, in all these countries of uh, being so surprised even in, 80s, in the early 90s of uh, the, this work coming from the United States. And the whole connection between Europe and the United States is interesting because you know, we're a nation of immigrants uh, and so many of our traditions that come out of people who have come here and shared them. And then the, you have the, especially in the 20th century, after World War II, when the, um, uh, especially GI Bill and all the programs were being expanded in schools in general, the uh, many programs in the craft media were added and, and that began to escalate. And in the beginning, we didn't have the faculty to teach. So you, the, you had the, uh, in, in Rochester, Franz Wildenhain, and you had Marguerite Wildenhain starting her own thing. You had the New Bauhaus, the Albers, and, and so, so many of the roots of this came from uh, people coming to America to share their expertise. Cranbrook Academy is almost, was most totally Scandinavian. So you have a um, kind of a history of, of influence Asian influence was strong much later. I mean, and still is today, of course. But at, at that point, they tend to be uh, mainly uh, European. Uh, uh, fact. So it was interesting to to see uh, as this evolved how eventually the American work uh, became um, uh, on its own and had its own. Uh, personality uh, or landscape of activity. And uh, I remember at one of the, it may have been uh, one of the craft shows, whether it was Philadelphia or here, that there was a Russian enamelist who was doing some excellent work. And I asked uh, him if uh, he had ever seen craft today, because I, I was curious if he lived in Moscow, I think. And he said, yes, that's why I came to America. <laughs> so these, and exhibitions have a lot of outreach. You know, you never know all the different uh, effects uh, that come from it. And uh, so I think um, overall it was a, uh, a very um, successful major thing, but a lot of it had to do with the fact that it was done on such a high professional level. And that's why I credit uh, Lee and his vision, and credit Johnson Wax for the funding that made it possible. And I think that uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, it was a monumental uh, task, really monumental. And so it was, uh, there's, uh, um, I think as I look back now, I, the other thing that I was thinking about, I mean, I, when I was here in about a year ago, I think. Um, uh, uh, um, so, someone on the staff came and said, you know, I want to speak to you because Objects USA is going to be 50 years old next year. And I was surprised because I didn't realize that. And uh, it, uh, it really um, <clears throat> then uh, motivated me to delve into this. And I'm certainly pleased to see so many uh, things coming uh, out of uh, this kind of 50th uh, celebration, including this event. But I think the, um, as I look at it, I think uh, in uh, a, uh, the timing was so great. <clears throat> it was perfect timing to do such a project <clears throat> because the, we saw so much new and interesting work emerge in the 50s in the, in the craft disciplines and uh, it escalated in the 60s. And I think that at the end of the 60s was just the ideal time to launch this, this survey. I mean, had it been done in the 50s, I don't think it would have had the excitement that it did at the end of the, of the 60s.
Wonderful. Well, do you have any final thoughts you want to well, share? Well, I think there was only one thing that I, I didn't, and when I was talking about the collection, I, I uh, would like just to state that we were um, very conscious of not only representing a, a, the spectrum of activity, because was, the idea was to show the variety of creativity in a different medium. And so we were consciously uh, in uh, ceramics, of course, is a very large area because that had a long tradition to show functional work and those designed for function. Uh, and the, but at the opposite end, the um, uh, sculptural expressions, personal uh, and two-dimensional works, which were, had been emerging in the 50s and 60s, and were really definitely much more aligned with the, the fine arts, but also the different areas of, of purpose, like it's interesting that there were several areas that had not emerged, like <clears throat> Ed Rossback's basket was a little small basket. Woven forms in that context of vessel forms, didn't, contemporary ones didn't exist. That became a whole movement later on. I'm not saying it was because of the show, but Ed Rossback was a very important teacher. And, this, and then, for example, his wife, Catherine uh, had a quilted um, wall hanging, but contemporary, there was a lot of quilting, but contemporary quilting didn't develop. And art to wear, uh, there were some, there was a lot of very good jewelry, and, uh, but there wasn't the whole art to wear. So there are many chapters of, of, uh, of that developed uh, that um, actually were reflected much more in the craft today show that I did later uh, on in 86. Thank you, and that's all the time we have. Um, if you have questions for Paul, please submit them on your cards and we'll get to those at the end of the program. Thank you so much okay. for your time, Paul. And before I bring up Janet, I'm gonna let this run out while I also remove some things from the stage. Lest you thought we forgot him. And now is my pleasure to invite up Janet Koblos to discuss an exhibition for the ages. I should explain, I hope it's not obvious, but um, I just arrived in Washington this morning at one from Spain. Um, so I'm hoping that the brain is not still in Spain on the main. We'll see how this goes. Um, anyhow, I'm inclined to say that the most history-making aspect of Objects USA could be captured in a single word, money. The scale of funding from a private company was extraordinary and could not be equaled by nonprofits or government agencies. It was enough money to cover extensive research by two major organizing individuals over a period of eight months, to cover traveling the exhibition, to cover what might be the most substantial catalog in the contemporary crafts field up to that time, and to cover buying and donating the entire exhibition. S.C. Johnson Company had some years earlier, as you've heard, in 1962, sponsored a similar exhibition, 
Art USA Now, which established the precedent. It traveled to 24 American cities and 16 countries in Europe and Asia. Yet it seems to almost have vanished from history. Google it and not much comes up. There is a New York Times article about the company purchasing the work of 102 artists and donating them to the National Collection of Fine Arts, plus a critical review of the catalog in Art Forum. I'm assuming that this absence um, is, uh, uh, from historical visibility is the consequence of the generality of the title of that show rather than a lack of response at the time, because surely that would have discouraged the Johnson Company from undertaking a single, similar project with crafts, yet Objects USA came into being and met with great appreciation. But if money was a necessary condition to making Objects USA a great exhibition, it was not a sufficient one. It still could have been an awful show or a mediocre show. So then you have to look at the particulars of Lee Nordness. The advantage was his general art background and a specific interest in the crafts so his approach was not parochial as it might have been from someone deeply entrenched in the crafts only. He looked for help with contacts and discoveries to the Museum of Contemporary Crafts, which led to his happy partnership with the young Paul Smith. Actually, they'd been acquainted for several years since Nordness organized an art survey show in 1959 and invited Smith to select some craft participants. Nordness had himself been collecting American crafts since the 50s and showed a few craftspeople in his gallery. Shall we say that the success was due to taste, maybe, or a good eye? Both men had it because Smith was already doing great work at the museum, notably his landmark exhibition, the 1963 Woven Forms, which marked the leading edge of the fiber sculpture movement. The museum was small, and the Crafts Council was not very bu bureaucratic at the time, which allowed Smith to respond to what he saw and put up shows in short time frames, more like a gallery than a museum. Interestingly, in 1968, he presented an exhibition called Objects Are... Dot, 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 question mark. It did not have a catalog. Maybe it was just that word was used because the language was changing. Maybe it was coincidental with Nordness's word choice. We could ask this question. Um, craftsman was fading away, and the designer craftsman term that was introduced in the 1950s began to seem inappropriate as the crafts moved away from function. Artist craftsman came to the fore, and also notably the term object maker. Moreover, the word had a place in concurrent minimalist sculpture with Donald Judd calling works specific objects. Nordness was billed as the sole author of the catalog, but he credits Smith as collaborator on the exhibition. It clearly was not the product of a committee mindset. There seems to have been no feeling of obligation to include the old war horses of the field, which gave the selection an edge of immediacy. While the majority of those shown were established and respected artists, some of the big names of the craft field were not included, such as Glenn Lukens in clay, Alan Adler in metals, Walker Weed in wood. And so the, ex the exhibition was not filling obligations by seniority. It was instead a picture of a blossoming and changing field. Makers such as George Timmock and Dick Marcus were only 24 years old in 1969 when they were chosen. And Wayne Higby was 26. Newcomers to the field such as June Kaneko and Nada Al-Halali were included. It bears mentioning that the exhibition was inclusive, strikingly inclusive. Women were well represented, even if the numbers might not be quite equal. There were not just Asians, such as Kaneko, but also more than single token black artists and Native Americans. These two examples were not alone. This inclusiveness could only have been intentional, and it was quite forward looking. You get a sense from looking at the show via the catalog that Nordness and Smith did not have to settle for what they could get, that they were able to operate largely without constraint. It's hard to know at this distance, except from the words of Paul Smith, whether it was easy or difficult to choose the large number of exhibitors and keep the quality high. 
it was limited to, th to about 300 to make it um, uh, possible to travel it. There was a tremendous energy flowing in the crafts then, the consequence both of the turn to crafts and art in general following word World War II with the aid of the GI Bill, expanding uh, craft and art programs, and the generational change of the 60s when the babies that all those GIs produced began to arrive at college age. Remember that the studio glass movement only came into being in the 60s when people apparently blew glass in white shirts and ties. <laughs> and fiber went to large scale in that decade, first through tapestry and then in free form. The Museum of Contemporary Crafts regularly sponsored Young Americans shows, encouraging the expanding number of baby boom makers. Objects USA seems to have caught that burgeoning of creativity. But let's consider the catalog itself. It's hardcover and 360 pages. More typical of the time were catalogs such as Smith's for Woven Forms, which is small and thin and has a brief text just beginning to grasp the idea that this work should be documented. Maybe the only substantial catalogs in the field at the time came from the California Design Program in Pasadena. So you can see that Objects USA was amazingly ambitious. And that catalog, I think, is a central part of the importance of Objects USA. Um, just, uh, not just that the show traveled and that a lot of people saw it, but that those of us who did not see it live could experience it later. The substantial catalog and the extensive illustrations make it possible for us to reclaim the experience to some degree. The exhibition is made less ephemeral. You and I can look at that catalog and get a broad representation of the exhibition, even if it lacks the physical resonance of being in that place at that time. Simply the number of photographs of the work is significant and the fullness of the explanation. Each artist is listed with biographical information and sometimes an artist statement and always a headshot to make it personal and individual. The other anomaly for catalogs of that era is that Nordness wrote a 15 page catalog essay. This, what you're seeing, is actually the first page of the essay. You'll notice that it is not titled and it does not have a byline either. An oddity from today's point of view is that Nordness doesn't seem to have had the urge to see his name everywhere, nor his image, which is why most of the um, pictures that I've just been showing you are poor scans from newspapers. There's no author's photo on the jacket of this book. There's no glossies of him in the files of the American Crafts Council, which is interesting. But to get back to the essay, from today's perspective, we might say that it's not as analytical of the art as it might be. His concerns seem to have been to establish a context and a history and a framework for definition above all. Nordness introduces his subject by stating that each work is made by a single person. He uses that as a distinction from design and from industry, and it even separates the work from the production of multi-person workshops such as the handmade pottery of Appalachia, which might be a family business or small scale industry. And he allows the individual to be designated as an artist or craftsman, depending upon how the person wishes to label himself. He adds that the work is, in most cases, created only in the taste and for the spiritual satisfaction of its maker. That's significant in two ways. It means that the making is not an assigned task and that the form is not determined by tradition. So it's not minge, which would be a communal aesthetic. He does not specifically say how it differs from uh, fine art. And the implication, the underlying presumption seems to be that it doesn't, although it's too bad he didn't elaborate. He calls it a new art form without saying exactly what makes it new. We might note that the maker's identity being self-declared rather than defined has continued to be true of the field until nearly the present day. Uh, and only now, when we are developing a critical mass of scholars, uh, can a different approach be taken. Then he reveals why this exhibition is called Objects USA rather than Crafts USA. Nordness was uncomfortable with the use of the word crafts, 
which he says ranges from therapeutic to folksy. He prefers the word object because it is a word without emotional content, and he finds the purity of the word preferable to pejorative con uh, connotations of handcraft. At another point, he refers to, quote, what I feel is a major problem facing the object and the object maker today, the problem of where the object and its creator are to be placed in the arbitrary hierarchy established between crafts and fine art. This is still the focus of argument today to some degree. Nordness seems to use the word not to assert a given character, but because of its evasiveness. He says he leaves it to the reader or the value judging connoisseur to decide if the object is also art. Objects can escape pigeonholing then. He establishes that it's individual, personal, and more conceptual than practical. He gives it a mixed lineage, um, uh, citing as precedents the English Art Workers Guild of 1844, the Arts and Crafts Exhibition Society, also English, of 1888, the German Bauhaus of 1919, and the individual American, Lewis Comfort Tiffany, who, quote, rebeautified the object but embraced the machine. In this list, he has encompassed a situation of artist design and artisan execution, one of artists and architects turning to handwork as social criticism, one of greater emphasis on design for modern materials via machines with craftsmanship and knowledge of materials as underlying principles, and the American idiosyncrasy of a designer brand that emphasized handwork, although it was not the handwork of the named person. As if to show how richly complicated is his subject, he spends considerable time in the essay discussing lifestyle. He introduces the idea by quoting the ceramist Robert Turner that after the war, craftsmen were less concerned with the object than with a way of life. Turner, a Quaker who had been studying painting before he became a conscientious objector during World War II, came out of that experience looking for integration in the language of the time. Nordness says that they were not seeking fame but a sort of spiritual harmony Nordness's term specifically is rapprochement with the universal. You recall that I've already quoted Nordness, Nordness referring to the craftsman's spiritual satisfaction in his work. We can assume that this is, does not mean literal religion, but rather value decisions. This is still a thread that runs through the crafts. The idea that making is a good way to spend your life, and especially in the case of functional works, the idea that this good life yields something that makes other lives better as well. Nordness also says of that time and those decisions, quote, craft seemed unencumbered by pressures from outside, parentheses, studio demand, uh, public, sorry, public demand, critics, and publicity. Ironically, the success of his exhibition and all the publicity across the nation and the discussion of the issues that he undertakes in the catalog all moved toward creating those pressures. Utterly central to the impact of the show was the breadth of exposure, both in terms of the number of venues and the amount of PR. A few years ago, Paul Smith noted in an interview, and repeated a bit of it today, but I'll quote him anyway, uh, that the exhibition premiered at the Smithsonian National Collection of Fine Arts that was important and symbolic to be in our nation's capital. It was launched with the company's public relations office that promoted it nationally and internationally. Aileen Saarinen was at the opening and did, a, a, um, and did an, an NBC Today show report. Later, when it was in New York, I was interviewed by Barbara Walters on Today, so it had vast visibility. And when it went to 22 art museums around the country, the tour is well documented, it generated enormous interest. There was also a film produced that uh, featured profiles on the artist Johnson's Wax brought, bought an hour of prime time on ABC, which was an important venue for the visibility of the project. The shift in the way crafts were regarded and had already, uh, had already begun, albeit slowly, two decades earlier in the spring 1950 issues, issue of Craft Horizons, a calendar of exhibitions was published for the first time. 
implying that just making and selling were not the whole stories, but that, uh, that looking via exhibitions was also part of the value of craft. Full-fledged reviews appeared in Craft Horizons beginning in 1955. Movement in that direction was then helped by the appearance on staff of Rose Slivka, an experienced, experienced writer and editor whose husband was a sculptor and who was a good friend of Elaine de Kooning. She operated in the art world and she brought more of it to the pages of Craft Horizons. Nordness, in his essay, called Craft Horizons the official journal and he gives several pages to consideration of its development. Some other notable assertions in the essay. He gives universities, not the art world, credit for bringing attention to crafts. He addresses the question of whether utility is a limitation. He cites intent in determining whether something is art. This last, by the way, has been named the intentional fallacy in the academic field of philosophy. It's not a satisfactory determinant because we can't always know the intention of the maker. But maybe we can just say that Nordness was on top of the concurrent inclination to say that this is art because I say it is. And I'll uh, confess here, this is not really a picture of a university, it's from Black Mountain. Involvement of a corporation in this project is important because government support has been so irregular and undependable. But corporations also come and go. In the 50s and 60s, there was a great deal of corporate money behind art art exhibitions. The Johnson Company was enlightened and personally supported the arts as well, commissioning a building from Frank Lloyd Wright and collecting personally. And still later, Karen Johnson Boyd became a benefactor of the Racine Art Museum near the company's headquarters. There are many other examples up to the present day um, although now it almost seems that corporate money for the arts is being used for salvaging a bad reputation. And some noble efforts, such as the Dayton Hudson Corporation's idea of getting companies to pledge a certain percentage of their profits to philanthropy, seem to have faded away. Nordness's coda to his essay lists these five important aspects of this representative cross-section that made up Objects USA. Survival of hand skills, beauty, tactility, intimacy, emotional, intellectual involvement. And then the true test. If this show had all these features and addressed these still valid concerns, uh, but the choices of work had not held up over time, it would be nothing but a historical curiosity rather than a model for such subsequent multimedia survey shows as the Renwick Gallery's The Object as Poet in 1976 or the Philbrook Museum's The Eloquent Object of 1987. You'll notice uh, that both of them used the word object and both had substantial catalogs. So let's look at the categories of work that drew the attention of Nordness and Smith. There were the obvious mediums that still characterize the crafts field today and a few surprises. One area that might have been included and was not is handmade paper and books. The first section was enamels. June Schwartz was a lasting superstar of the medium, even as other enamelists have vanished from our awareness, whether justifiably or not. Significant fig uh, figures of the time included along with Schwartz are Kenneth Bates, Ella Marie Woolley, Harold Helwig, and Paul Holtberg. Uh, enamels would surely not get its own section in a comprehensive exhibition today. It survives largely as a subset of jewelry and aside from that, through the dedicated exhibition and book efforts of Hal Nelson and Bernard Jazzar. The second section was ceramics, and this one was full of winners. Interestingly, Nordness says in his essay, quote, in general, the growth of the entire crafts movement in the US will be approached in this text through ceramics. Although he does give a chronology of metals in, uh, in, from the 30s, weaving from the 40s, and glass in the 60s. Clay is probably no older or more numerous than textiles, but it has the advantage of more often being marked. Many textiles were unsigned. And it lacked the stigma of being a primarily female field uh, that textiles still struggles with today, even in our era of pushing for gender equality. At any rate, the ceramic selections for Objects USA includes a huge number of figures already or becoming major. 
such as, um, including the slides you've seen earlier, the Natzlers, Maya Grotel, Carlton Ball, both Wildenhains who were divorced by then, Henry Varnum Poor, the Shires, Beatrice Wood, Ruth Duckworth, Ken Ferguson, John Glick, Byron Temple, Karen Carnes, John Mason, and Peter Volkos. Volkos, who had shifted to metal in the 60s, is represented by the 1959, slightly out of date, uh, cross, as well as one more recent vessel work. As I mentioned, there was also the young Wayne Higby, not yet making um, the landscape work that later brought him fame, but someone of these men, or both of them, had the good sense to see that he would amount to something. Another is um, characteristic, although early work, by Patty Bauer, who is identified in the very first words here as wife of ceramist Fred Bauer. <laughs> Fred Bauer left the field long ago, but she is a hero, of course, who we know today as Patty Wereshina. Robert Arneson was more mature at the time and is represented by three works showing the direction in which he was going. The work from his Alice House series is quite large, almost seven feet across. The sink is closer to his signature irreverent style, combining humor and repulsion. We see in these and other examples that Nordness and Smith were able to identify potential as well as achievement. The glass category, which included Jim Tanner and Richard Marcus, who I've already shown, also gave two pages to Joel Philip Myers. His spread includes an exceptional artist statement that not only talks about the color of the piece and his process, but even about feeling as well. Myers had a degree in design from Parsons and training in ceramics from Alfred, and he had been the design director of a glass company. Which of those things led him to make that kind of an artist statement, I don't know. Statements were also in the process of developing in the field at that time. Other glass artists featured in the show were such leading figures as Harvey Littleton, Dominic Levino, and Robert Sowers, and the younger cohort of Marvin Leposky, Dale Chihuly, and Mark Pizer, among others. Um, the fourth section is metal, and this is clearly objects, or when they get bigger, more realistically titled uh, sculpture, including a then quite recent Volkos piece. Also shown was classic hollowware by Hans Christensen, Fred Fenster, John Pripp, Ronald Hayes Pearson. Jewelry, the fifth group, to my mind, is one of the most delightful. It includes the work of Charles Lolama, another Native American whose wife, Otelli, was among the ceramic artists in the show. His work clearly relates to traditional jewelry of the Southwest, but in a forceful, modernist manner that was his own. There was also elegant jewelry by Mary Rink and Margaret Craver, representing different generations and quite different aesthetics, were Ramona Solberg with her collections of ethnic artifacts and symbolic objects, and Ken Corey, who worked in new materials and referred to na uh, narrative, humor, and counterculture. Arlene Fish's representative works included her celebrated body ornaments. The sixth category might take you by surprise, plastic. Not a conventional craft material, but one that shows that Nordness did not see crafts as being tied to traditional mediums only. But maybe it was just the time. The Graduate came out in 1967. <laughs> the examples included in Objects USA uh, included uh, work by uh, people more often associated with other materials. Ted Hallman's uh, textiles show the way it was worked in. Uh, similar instances are David Weinreb, who was better known for ceramics, and Wendell Castle, better known for wood. Carolyn Kriegmans, whose work you see here, um, jewelry and wearables, uh, led the way into exploration of this new artificial material and is a more pure example. The seventh category um, is, like enamels, one that would not stand on its own today, mosaic. It includes only two artists and leaves me wondering why Nordness felt that they couldn't be left out. The artists are Glenn Michael and Alexandra Kasuba, and unfortunately, since I was drawing simply from the catalog, neither work is very photographical, although it's not being represented here. But if you see the catalog, you'll get a better idea. Number eight is wood. 
And here we see freeform sculpture by J.B. Blunk, very unconventional and expressive in a 60s-esque style. Blunk has just recently emerged into prominence in sculpture in, with important gallery representation in Los Angeles and New York. There were also classic stools by Wharton Escherich, turnings by Bob Stocksdale, furniture by George Nakashima and Wendell Castle. The ninth and last group is the other big one, Fiverr. Like ceramics, it includes some forgotten artists, but also a rich array of major figures, Annie Albers, Dorothy Leibis, and Jacqueline R. Larson on the design side, Mary Walker Phillips, who pushed knitting into sculpture, Lillian Elliott and Ed Rosbach, who were leading the way into basketry, Trudy Guermanpre and Lenore Tawney for sculptural hangings, Kay Sakamachi, then known for incredibly complex weavings that opened out into three-dimensional forms and more and more. Glenn Kaufman was only in his 30s at the time, and this knotted work is not typical of his best-known works to come. Sheila Hicks was an innovator then who has, in the last decade, like J.B. Blunk, also come to greater prominence within uh, New York art galleries and uh, having a retrospective at the Institute of Contemporary Art in Philadelphia, finally getting her greater recognition. In addition, there were lesser known individuals whose work can be particularly interesting, such as Nick Kravitsky, Marilyn Pappas, and Sophie Newholy, a Teton Sioux. There were enough people who have remained pivotal to the crafts to say that the selection judgments were impressively sensitive. Only in a few cases do I, at least, cringe at the only then quality of a work. And I'm surprised that this was selected out for showing earlier, because to me it looks like something that I would see at the State Fair. Um, but overall, leafing through the catalog is a pleasurable look at early and developing work by artists that went on to be important. Objects USA was significant as reinforcement for the work uh, the, for the worth and interest of contemporary crafts. It might be just as significant as a public relations move, a sales strategy, increasing the audience for crafts in shops and at fairs. It also presented crafts seriously in many, many museums, not only in the traveling show, but by dividing up the collection so that those museums would have pieces on which to build their own collections. It was a starting point. It pointed away from function and tradition, both in its selections and their individual presentation. And indeed, that's largely how the field has gone. Still, when I think about Objects USA, I think about how crucial the catalog is. The essay took crafts seriously, introduced many of the philosophical themes that still engage the field, and presented a panoply of works in many mediums and styles. As for its impact, the very fact that we're here today proves the point. And it's worth noting that Lee Nordness's Lee, sorry, Lee Nordness's 1995 obituary in the New York Times identified him as art dealer who promoted the crafts. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. I now welcome up Roseanne Summerson, president of RISD, to talk to us about the lasting influence of Objects USA. Thank you so much. It's a real pleasure to be here, and I want to thank the organizers and supporters of the event. And uh, it's really uh, just, I just have to take a moment to really thank Paul Smith, because um, he has been such a pivotal person not just in the field of crafts and art, but also in my career. And, um, and I really, uh, you know, I'll make reference to it later, but I really feel that I wouldn't be here where I am today without Paul Smith, so it's a personal thank you. Um, the, I came to, into this work a little bit later. I'm one of the only speakers, I guess, who was in the show, Poetry of the Physical, so I was an artist. Um, 
And so when I first learned about this work, I learned about it as a student. So I was fairly young. I was older than, you I know, mean, the show happened before, uh, basically when I was being born. But um, when I was trying to find something that would sort of encapsulate how I felt about seeing that catalog, this quote came to me, life is not measured by the number of breaths we take, but by the moments that take our breath away. And when I first saw this catalog and learned about this whole field of work, my, it took my breath away. I, it, I realized that there was something out there that was um, beyond what I had imagined when I entered art school. I entered as a photographer and very quickly um, decided that I wanted to do something more physical and I found the wood shop and woodworking and decided that that would be my direction. And, and that process, learning about this show was a pivotal moment for me in understanding the kind of possibilities of making things in materials. And at the time, Peter Volkus was a real figure that we were learning about um, because of his irreverence, because of the fact that Peter was taking a material and exploiting it for what it shouldn't do, which you know, to art students is very exciting, because uh, that's what we were all doing in our personal lives. But this sense of you know, taking a material and almost making it ugly, pulling it apart, distressing it, um, slapping it together in ways that were not the ways that we had expected someone to respond to a material was a very pivotal lesson for us as young art students. And objects like this, which you know, are in retrospect beautiful, but at the time were seen as a, sort of aggressive responses to con contradicting the material and what the material would do became very influential. And um, it'll be interesting to see which, which um, images we've all picked out, because you've seen some of these. Um, but this uh, cross and its kind of spiritual connotation was also very fascinating. And I was not someone who ever really did ceramics, but these were influential, iconic works that we were learning about as we were developing as young students, our own aesthetics and our own approach to dealing with materials and with making. And we were always um, informed uh, or introduced to making as a very intellectual process. Really critical making is what we've called it at RISD, but it's the sense of the intelligence of the hand, the intelligence of materials, the intelligence of the process of actually making something that didn't exist before come to life. And there were um, icons like Beatrice Wood who was again, as has been mentioned in, in the excellent presentations prior to this, there were a lot of women uh, role models, not in the fine arts world in the same way, but in this world there were. And interestingly, they were so connected with the fine arts world. Um, Beatrice Wood was living in Greenwich Village. She was friends with Isadora Duncan, Edna St. Vincent Millay, Man Ray, and she fell madly in love with and had an affair with Marcel Duchamp. So her work was being heavily influenced by the work of the fine arts, and she was actually started a publication with Marcel Duchamp called The Blind Man, and she was called the Mama of Dada, which is kind of interesting, and also went on to have a, a simultaneous affair with um, one of his best friends. And the menage a trois, people don't necessarily know this history, but it inspired Truffaut's landmark film Jules and Jim about a menage a trois. So, there was lots happening in the art world that was influencing the craft world in a way that was somewhat different than what would have seemed to be the more kind of um, expected trajectory of the, of the decorative arts. And I think that's an interesting um, influence that influenced a lot of us as young artists. Um, she has a really fascinating uh, story, which I won't go into fully, but after the menage a trois, she ended up becoming a follower of Krishnamurti and um, so on and so on. So there was a very interesting story, but she was not necessarily an elegant ceramist. She um, was really kind of struggling with learning the techniques. I don't think that was what interested her so much, but the expression of the objects was interesting. And she died um, in 1998 at 105 and had worked every day at her potter's wheel until she was 103. So um, that was, was um, interesting also as a um, person looking back now. Um, June Kaniko was a fascinating human being and was actually teaching at RISD when I was a student there in the 70s. And 
Um, his wife knit him these beautiful sweaters that look just like his work, these bright, bold, striped sweaters. I tried to find a picture of one for this, but I wasn't able to find a good picture. But the scale and the intensity and the, the color and vibrancy of his work was hugely influential to those of us working in walnut and maple and cherry. And, um, and just the, the incredible ambition of his work was really inspiring to all of us as we were developing as young artists. Also, the, um, the sense of um, the, the comfort in dealing with issues of the body and with scale were um, really inspiring. This is 1967. At this point, you know, I hadn't started art school yet, so we were looking back at these things later. Um, I was in art school in the mid-70s. Robert Strini was another interesting character who was from the West Coast, and there was this, in the furniture field, which was my field, there was this great divide between the East and the West. The West Coast um, woodworking, and I'm not sure if Glenn's gonna get into that later, but it was a very different set of styles, a very different set of um, technical approaches and use of the material. The East Coast work was coming much more out of universities that had an interest more in fine joinery and engineering and using materials in sort of minimal ways rather than the kind of grand scale ways that was happening in a, uh, a lot on the West Coast. And Robert Strini came along as this kind of hybrid sculptor who came and worked with us for a six week uh, winter session class. And the deal was that if you wanted to be in his class, you had to be up at five in the morning, meet him at a certain diner, have breakfast with him, and then be at the studio by 6.30 and work until you collapsed at night, which we all did. And it was a tremendous um, experience. He was working in multiple materials. This is stoneware, this is clay, but at RISD he had begun to do these incredibly ornate, um, elaborate laminations um, and made these kind of vehicle-like sculptures that were astoundingly constructed. And he invented all kinds of techniques that were independent from the ones that we were learning. And for us as students, really opened up the boundaries of what making in our material could be. So he was a, an incredible influence um, for a lot of us. Similarly, Tommy Simpson was in the area. And Tommy um, worked in a very different aesthetic, but was a, a, an incredibly um, productive artist. He was prolifically making things one after the other. And so his work, which here, um, if, if you look back at the picture, um, there's this feather in the image. And the piece that Tommy had in the show was called Man Balancing a Feather on His Nose. And nose is spelled K-N-O-W-S. And that was a real sort of Tommy kind of irony, really dealing with this sense of humor, but um, humor that had an edge to it. And um, he um, went on to make incredible objects that sort of pulled out of the folk tradition, but used uh, materials in very sophisticated ways. And somewhat like uh, Wharton Eschrick, who is another big influence, really thought about the furniture as part of a whole interior experience. And um, did a book called Handmade Houses, where he really took that to the point of the house being the furniture, the scale being the same from the intimate to the, um, to the architecture. Jerry Osgood was another huge influence, and Jerry had a really particular approach that was unique in the field. Um, this was his piece in the show, The Fiddleback Mahogany Chest of Drawers in 1969. And it's, for those of you who aren't furniture makers, part of the amazing thing about this was that he was making um, compound curves that fit together in a way that really hadn't been explored um, since the French bomb chests. And so this was uh, bringing this really interesting and very complex technique of multiple bent laminations in compound shapes to a place that inspired an enormous amount of technical mastery among the furniture makers as they begun to evolve their field. Um, this is a piece that's in the RISD Museum, which is shell desk, which is uh, playing off the kind of timbre desk. But this, again, are laminations that are formed, tapered, and connected to one another, almost like a very um, fine kind of boat, you know, wooden handmade boat. But Jerry had this attitude about materials and structures. One of his famous assignments that he used to give students was called the 7% chair. 
And the idea was to make a chair that was so beautifully constructed, so beautifully engineered, and with such important joinery that it was 7% above the breaking point. And which is a kind of metaphorical idea because obviously it wasn't really tested to the point where people would you know, want to break their chairs, but it, it was about a perspective and a point of view which was very different than the work of J.B. Blunk and Wendell Castle and others who were using the materials in, ex in very different ways. Jack Pripp was also at RISD and um, as an 18-year-old um, freshman at RISD, I had the opportunity to live in his house for a while while he and, and his wife were on sabbatical and traveling. And that was a totally eye-opening experience because their house was full of craft, every aspect of it the salad bowls, the, the serving um, trays, the textiles, and it was like walking into this world of wonder as a young person, and it had a huge Im influence on me um, as a young maker. And um, these are some of the objects that we're fortunate to have in the RISD Museum, some of Jack's hollowware. Later in um, his career, he um, had an injury, a kind of bursitis um, in his shoulder from just years of, of uh, making hollowware objects. And um, being the artist that he was, he went to a different medium in metal and started folding paper and designing flatware with um, kind of folded origami-like surfaces that didn't require the same kind of hammering and I think did some of the most beautiful work of his life, at later in life, because of this injury. And it was a wonderful lesson to tell students about the fact that you put your own limitations in front of you and you can move them aside and find ways to make them take you to new places. So he was the, ex the example of that for me. This is a silver and ebony tea set which is actually on display right now in the RISD Museum. Arlene Fish is someone who also had a profound influence on so many people, um, particularly in San Diego where she taught for many years. She also brought me onto the board of the Haystack School in Deer Isle, Maine, and many of these artists have a connection to Haystack and to Penland as well. If you um, have the opportunity to go to Portland, Maine right now, there's a wonderful exhibition about the legacy years of the founding of Haystack, which are these late 50s, early 60 years, and a number of the objects that have been shown today are in that show, and you can see them in person at the Portland Museum of Art. But Arlene um, was um, just a, an amazingly dedicated teacher, dedicated her whole life to making her work and to teaching others, and um, was always trying to cultivate young women and help them to be successful in their careers. Um, and this piece was shown earlier, but I wanted to show you sort of a progression that I thought was interesting in preparing for this, because this was the piece in the show, this body ornament, which, um, is, you know, almost has the sense of an uh, x-ray or something. It has this real sense of the body almost um, literally, but it was all made out of, of um, metal, silver. And then this piece was actually is um, in the Haystack show, because I just took this photograph last weekend at the show, and it's half woven and half silver, and it's a collar. Um, and after she um, got to Haystack, she studied textiles with Jack Leonard Larson, who was teaching there. I think she was his teaching assistant. And she returned herself to teach in the 60s, and this piece she made in 66, and it was inspired by the moss and the landscape um, of Haystack. So she was taking that natural environment, which is so beautiful, and, and then really representing it um, literally in her work, but I liked seeing this piece as this bridge between her metal work and her weaving because later in her life she became known for woven um, metals and making these elaborate um, body ornaments and jewelry pieces that use the notion of woven metal. So she brought those things together into a new place. Um, this is a piece called Silver and Pink Circles in 2005. And Arlene always would critique the fact that I wore too much black. She was always dressed in bright colors, turquoises and pinks. And so we had that um, kind of fun um, uh, difference about us. Um, Ruth Radakovich was also somebody that I found really interesting as a um, kind of inspiration. She um, was 
was an American who was very interested in um, serving in the war. And she went and learned how to fly a plane and wanted to be a whack really badly, but she was turned down. So she really wanted to help the war effort. And she, um, she joined, at the end of the war, she joined the UN Relief and Rehabilitation Mission, which brought her over to Eastern Europe and Yugoslavia, where she met um, her husband, who was Toza Radakovich, and they fell in love, and um, then the Iron Curtain was beginning to come down, so they were forced to leave Yugoslavia and decided to come here. She was a very good friends with Karen Pripp, which was interesting, in Denmark, and so she went to visit Karen and um, did a sort of European tour, and then decided to escape and come here. And she studied here and eventually attended the School for American Craftsmen in, at RIT, where a number of these artists were teaching or were connected or were showing in the um, galleries there. And she became friends with the Prips, with the Pearsons, Ronald and Kay Pearson, who um, were also very connected to Haystack, to the Wilden Haynes, to the Skoog Forces, to, the, um, to Tay Frid, who was my teacher, and to um, a number of artists who were all connected in this early craft movement. Um, what I found, she also became friends with Arlene Fish when she eventually moved out to California. What I found interesting um, in her piece in the show, which was this fiberglass door with these resin um, lenses, the, the lenses in there uh, in the, are like portholes, but they feature magnifying glass, and they distort the view of the image on the other side. And so she was dealing with this, you know, what we would call now user experience, but this, um, the sense of interactivity and really an unorthodox approach to materials, particularly for a woman at that time. So I found this to be a really bold and um, interesting piece. Um, I mentioned Wharton Eschrick earlier. Wharton, I think for anyone who um, makes furniture objects or maybe objects in general, Wharton is kind of a hero to all of us. His, um, this is a, a picture from inside his house, which was um, in Paoli, Pennsylvania. It's a, it's a foundation now, you can visit there. He was very good friends with the architect Louis Kahn, and they worked on this magical house together, and this is just one image. But his sense of, um, of the spirit of creating a completely other world um, within his work was something that made huge impact on all of us. Um, he also was friends with the Cubists and uh, several of the artists who were Cubist painters and sculptors, and so he had this Cubism influence in early in his work. And um, this spiral three-step ladder, and Cherry, um, became a seminal piece of influence for many furniture makers. Um, and I think you could see the roots of other furniture makers who were inspired by this piece. But, Wharton was really quite a phenomenal artist, sculptor, printmaker, and in some ways, house builder. Another um, kind of hero in our world was Sam Maloof, um, an, an incredibly hardworking, long-careered um, furniture maker who was from the West Coast um, and had a very different style, again, to the construction methods that he would use, to the ones that we learned on the East Coast. It was really a, a coastal thing. But I remember seeing this picture in the catalog, and then later, in the, this was in the Poetry of the Physical, right? Didn't this, this was in the second show as well. Because I remember seeing this piece in person um, in the Poetry of the Physical show. I remember seeing this at the Museum of Decorative Arts at the Louvre, um, and just being so taken with the fact that um, somebody would think to put a cradle inside of a cabinet, and the sort of, um, symbolism of the notion of the way that families fit together. And that had a big influence on me and in my own work later on. But I loved the ingenuity of it. It's just, it just seemed so unexpected. Um, and it was very different than most of what Sam came to be known for later, which were mostly his seating and his rockers. Um, and Sam became a friend to the whole field of woodworking. and. Uh, just inspired and supported so many young people and actually produced a scholarship for young um, furniture makers. And so he's had a, an enormous influence and you know, worked well into his 90s. I think this craft thing is really good for longevity um, based on a number of these artists and, and seeing how 
clear Paul is, which is really amazing, um, and many others of you in the audience. George Nakashima was another incredible influence, and George, I think many of you may know, was part of the um, internment camp uh, nightmare, which is a hard thing to talk about right now because you know some of us are concerned that we're making our own version of it currently. But anyway, George um, brought this incredible sense of the natural material into his work and this conoid bench, um, English walnut, hickory and black walnut in, from 1969, was a great example of his influences from the Shakers and the Windsor chair makers, but also his sense of the beauty of the natural slab and finding ways to stabilize that that became ornaments in the pieces themselves and um, created a whole, a whole particular um, path of uh, his own aesthetic within the larger field. Lenore Tawney was another artist who was very interesting um, to me because she, um, she was really approaching her work, as was said earlier, as a fine artist and bringing what was um, really blurring the boundary between craft and fine art. She was very good friends with Agnes Martin. As you can see, I think they had a kind of similar um, interest in the way that they approach their work together. And um, she uh, lived in Paris and in Africa, North Africa and Europe, and studied um, weaving at the Penland School of Crafts. So again, there's this connection with a lot of these artists with Penland and other places as well as universities. And um, in 1957, she decided to move to New York City from Chicago where she was living and devote herself to weaving. And um, she said that she left Chicago to seek a bearer life closer to reality without all the things that clutter and fill our lives. Now, I was surprised to hear that she moved to New York City. <laughs> I could have suggested maybe some other locations, but she did move to New York. And um, she was um, part of a, of a neighborhood with neighbors like Robert Indiana, Ellsworth Kelly, Agnes Martin, as I mentioned. And um, so these artists had enormous influence on her work and it showed, I think, in her work uh, in a way that really kind of anchored it in a different uh, part of the craft world. And um, in an interview, and again, longevity, shortly before her death at the age of 100, she remarked that the first 100 years were the hardest. <laughs> Um, Bob Stocksdale and Kay Sakamachi were also a husband and wife team. Um, she was a t fiber artist and he was known for his beautifully turned um, bowls and trays and wooden objects. And um, when I w in 1979, I got a kind of interesting job working for, I was working for Fine Woodworking at the time, which was a magazine in our field. And I was um, in California and I got to go up the whole California coast and then take a right at the top and come back home, visiting every wood shop along the way of a known maker. So I was able to visit J.B. Blunk and, and um, Maloof and all of these incredible makers. And I spent quite a wonderful visit with, the Sto with Bob Stocksdale and, um, and with Kay. And uh, it was so interesting to see. He lived in this completely cluttered environment and um, and I've known students like this too who you know you walk into their studio space and it's just a disaster. You don't even know what you're looking at or where to find it and out of that mayhem comes this absolute jewel object and and he was one of those people that was the, the lathe was you know, in a, just buried in sawdust and out of the basement in this kind of modest shop came these ex extremely eloquent, beautiful objects. And um, Kay, similarly, and I think the cross influence on them in the sense of the delicate scale and proportion that they used in their work had a great influence on one another. This was um, woven um, with ni nylon monofilament in 1968. And so rather than going through a lot of the artists in um, the show, because I think you've gotten um, to see a lot of that, I wanted to sort of pull forward some of the ideas that I saw as elements of um, really transformational thinking in this early show and then talk about how those same ideas are being addressed today with just a couple examples of some, some contemporary artist's work. This is Lothar Windels, who is now the head of the furniture department um, at RISTI. 
And this is his Joseph chair, um, which is, um, it, it's been made in um, many different colors. It's industrial felt. And um, it reminded me, when I was trying to think of an example of a contemporary person dealing with some of the same issues, it reminded me of the unusual approach to material that a lot of the predecessors from the early show also represented. And also, um, he recently uh, constructed one of these for a collection um, in Providence, and um, he built it on site. They built, he builds these things on site. So he showed up with a couple of rolls of industrial felt and some fasteners, and, and it, it takes about five hours, but he you know, can put one together with a, another person helping. So the ingenuity of the construction technique is something that is as ingenious as the, uh, material, the use of the material. There's also, I think, in a lot of the contemporary work, a real um, blurring between the notion of made, handmade and the notion of design, and also the notion of using manufacturing as a hand process. Um, and this is something that he sees as a manufactured chair, even though they are um, essentially assembled by hand. Um, Ian Stell is another artist who um, is a more recent um, designer, craftsman, makes um, work that's exquisitely made, but very um, different point of view. This is a mirror called Articulated Gordian Knot, and it, um, you can stretch it in all different directions, and so it, it looks like that, or it looks like that, or it looks like that, and um, it expands and contracts and rotates. And so he's using these industrial processes and if you think back about the Radakovich door in the sense of the user being engaged in kind of making the experience of the piece, um, Ian is doing that in a contemporary way. This is a picture of David Byrne um, playing with it at one of the design fairs, so we had to capture that. And Rosie Lee, who is a, um, another uh, designer who is working on the kind of border between design, craft, one-of-a-kind production. These are some of her lights. Um, the Inez collection inspired by the forests of the Yucatan and their brush copper and satin brass antique copper and um, different patinas. And um, she has a range of work that she does from this sort of more production work to um, very one-off kind of pieces. But I think in choosing her as an example here, I think you can see the connection back to some of the early jewelry and some of the early even fiber pieces that were in the original show. And you know, I'm not at all aware of the fact that that show influenced her work, but there is just sort of a lineage that runs through the generations. And I can see this kind of thread um, in looking at her work. Um, Brody Neal, who is a, he's the one on the, on the um, <laughs> right? Um, he uh, is um, a designer who came from Australia, came um, to RISD as a graduate student. Um, Tanya's smiling because she knows him and hasn't seen this picture with his baby. And um, he uh, lives in London now and does a big range of work. But I chose Brody's work because I think it really represents so well this trajectory of, if you think about some of the early work from the show, and this sense that um, this, this almost looks like it's totally handmade, the way Sam Maloof would make a chair. But Brody is using computers and new technology to make things that have the appearance and the design aesthetic of the handmade and require some hand work. They're not just being made at a factory. He's making these things. But it's taking the best of technology and the best of handwork and the use of materials and pulling it all together. This is, um, his business is made in ratio. This is um, the alpha chair, and these are some examples. These stack, by the way, so they, um, which is a real um, a challenge to make a chair that stacks, that's beautiful, and also ergonomically comfortable. And um, this piece is also Brody. It's a um, contemporary rendition of a 19th century specimen tabletop. And it's called gyro. And the materials, and it's quite large. It's probably about 60 inches in diameter. The materials in it are um, a mix of precious marble, 
timber and ivory made into something that he calls ocean terrazzo, and it's bound together by combining it with um, lots of fragments of ocean plastic waste. And um, one of the things that I'm so excited about with this new generation of artists is that they're really using their platform to talk about issues of politics, issues of gender, issues of identity. One of those artists will be speaking soon. I, it, was, it was hard for me not to include Tanya, but I knew she'd be here to speak on her own. So, um, But that's a really exciting move that um, we can look forward to. And I'll just end with this um, quote by Nina Simone, which is really about that fact, which is, how can you be an artist and not reflect the times? So the artists of the original show were so much about moving their field, moving their time, moving society, moving their culture, and artists are continuing to do that um, today and I think always will. Thank you. Thank you so much, President Summerson, and thank you to Janet and Paul for our session this afternoon. We're, going, we're a little bit ahead of time, but we're still going to go ahead and take a break right now. We'll take a 20-minute break and return at 5 o'clock to pick up with Tanya and Glenn and Sarah.
do you, I mean, sure. Yeah. Can one of you to come up to um, one call? Be efficient. Anything that saves time. Before we resume for the afternoon, we found a pair of glasses in the lobby uh, during the break. If you are missing a pair of glasses, they are at the information table in the lobby. So um, you can go fetch those. And a reminder, after this session ends, we will have a question and answer session with all of our speakers from today. Please use the cards found in your program. If you have more than one question, you're welcome to head back out to the lobby or raise your hand and we'll bring you an extra. Or you can also just write several on the card. We'll collect these after the end of the session and we will have that question and answer session afterward. And now I am delighted to welcome Glenn Adamson, Sarah Archer, and Tanya Aguaniqua to talk about Objects USA. There we go. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so yes, as our title suggests, we have arrived at the collective shrug part of the afternoon. Uh, no, in all seriousness, what we thought we would do, and, and I, I will share with you that, believe it or not, Tanya and I thought of this title at exactly the same moment of a conference call. Um, so clearly it was destined. And what we thought we might do is interrogate the two primary terms from the original show and how they feel today. So we'll get to that in a minute. But first, uh, in case there are some few of you who have not been so fortunate as to encounter Tanya's work previously, we thought it would be great if she could explain a little bit about her practice, which we'll also be using as a kind of point of reference and inspiration for our conversation. So Tanya, please. Hi. Um, so the images that are in the back are images of some of my work, and they're going to be rotating on their own during our talk so that you're not confused at all my work. Um, and so I, uh, I live in Los Angeles, and I was um, raised in Tijuana, Mexico. Um, and I cross the border every day to go to school in the US. Um, and during that crossing um, and spending time in San Diego, I ended up um, learning from a random person that there was a furniture program at San Diego State. Um, and so this person told me to go there and study. And so then I went there and studied. Um, and so my background is actually in furniture design. So I have a, a bachelor's and a master's in furniture design. And my master's professor was Roseanne Summerson. She was the department head at that time. Um, and the, just so super quickly to kind of tell you a little bit about my training and what I do. Um, so in undergrad, um, we had to get trained in all of the different disciplines in craft um, because the degree was called applied design. And so we had to be trained in, um, in wood, in ceramics, jewelry and metal smithing, and fiber. Um, and so then that was kind of the background that I had going into furniture. Um, and before I went into furniture design, um, I was working really um, intensively in community activism um, and working specifically at the US-Mexico border as part of the border art workshop. Um, so now it's been 22 years of me having worked in craft in general um, and in community activism um, and very specifically through um, border work and migrant, um, migrant rights work. And so a lot of the work that I do now um, focuses on how to combine and how to activate craft as a starting point for conversations that lead us into larger um, issues of human rights um, and identity and gender and all of these different things. Um, so a lot of the work that we do at the studio, the studio is all female. Um, we have for the past, I think probably like seven years, been uh, really focusing on fiber uh, more so than furniture. Okay, great. Thanks, yeah. Tanya. So um, what we thought we would do, as I said, is, is talk about each of these two key terms. And so, Sarah, I'm going to ask you to start off with objects. But before, um, before you uh, launch into that, I just wanted to make a kind of simple observation, which is that for almost everyone here, Objects USA doesn't actually exist as a bunch of objects in a room that we saw and experienced. And so I'll just speak from my own experience that 
when I was in graduate school, I encountered the book, Objects USA, and all the pictures and texts in it, and it really became the Bible for me as, a, as an aspir aspirational craft historian. And just parenthetically, I did want to say to Roseanne that if she ever gets tired of running RISD, we craft historians would love to have you because you clearly have a lot of skills in that regard. But, um, but you know, I, I called up J.B. Blunk because I found his name in a phone book because I found him in Objects USA. It was really like a list of things to find out about and that it was still resonating for people of my generation and I'm sure graduate students today would this, say the same thing really speaks to the longevity of that documentation project and in turn the power of images and the kind of second order phenomenon that exists around and beyond these objects. So it, it's kind of an ironic thing, but even Objects USA itself doesn't mostly consist of objects for most of us because they're often museums and we only can access them through these, um, through these second order uh, mediated contexts. Um, so that, that sort of may be an appropriate lead in to the uh, conversation about objects now and what an object is in 2019 that it perhaps wasn't in 1969. So Sarah. Yeah, it's, uh, is this, yes, hi everybody. Um, one thing that I found interesting about the presentations is that I think it was only Paul who mentioned that Objects USA was pre-computer. And when we were, uh, you know, kind of creating Google Docs and having conference calls talking about this event, we were sort of thinking, okay, 1969, 2019, and the two sort of standout things were, of course, the moon landing and Objects USA. That's, you know, what any American would immediately say um, about that year. But to think about the time period that that brackets is so interesting vis-a-vis -vis technology because you have things like um, the fact that the Muse Museum of Modern Art, uh, some years ago, maybe 10 years ago, acquired a symbol. So it, which is not a physical object that you can hold in your hand. Um, Objects USA for most of us is a book, right? That you can, that's the, the, the tangible piece of it. And I think there's been, for people of sort of our generation-ish, um, I was actually uh, sort of at the Bard Graduate Center before craft was invented there. Like you sort of couldn't really study post-war studio craft, as strange as that sounds now. Um, I just missed Catherine Whalen, so I was kind of, um, you know, kind of studying Islamic art and writing about the Civil War and not totally clear, as you can probably tell from that combination, what I was going to do. So I really learned studio craft by being an intern and then an assistant at MAD and working on the show that would eventually become uh, Crafting Modernism. So I think thinking about not having had the kind of academic background ahead of time, sort of encountering these things and kind of thinking um, the, the time period was so much about the mass market and so, uh, uh, you know, when viewer, sort of museum goers would um, be used to a kind of Levittown, Woolworths universe where mass market goods were cheap and abundant, um, to thinking now craft often is a way of signaling and prop, sort of to use an, a, an academic word, problematizing who made this, like in Tanya's work, thinking about where does this fiber come from? Um, if something is made of hair, why? And a person in the general public, I think in 2019, is much more likely to look at a work of art and say like, oh, I wonder why that artist used upcycled t-shirts. I wonder what that's about. What does that mean? Similarly, we're much more apt to do that when we're shopping, right? Like we're much more likely now in 2019 to say like, mm, do I really want to buy a t-shirt at Target when I know that it was made probably in non-ideal conditions and that the environmental cost of it might be too high? Do I want to pay more? So I think that there's one of the big shifts around objects probably has been um, th that kind of questioning of how something is made and what that being an artistic gesture and that probably one of the legacies of Objects USA is that it went a long way toward bringing this material to a very wide national audience and kind of starting that conversation. So, so I guess um, you know one thing we could say is that the excitement around objects in the late 60s, and as, as uh, Janet, I think, rightly said, it was a term that was in vogue, and it, it reminds me also of words like work, mm -hmm. or sight, or even the word interesting. So these kind of placeholder words that people tend to use a lot in the art world, particularly, because mm -hmm. they are so inspecific, they kind of are helpful for sliding past things. And it, it helps when you don't know what you're talking about. I mean, to, in yeah. fairness, like if you're not totally sure, like I'm working on a project and I'm, I don't really know what this is, it might be social practice, it might yeah. be craft, it might be both. If you call it a work, you're, you're good to go. Or a project. Or a project. Right? Yeah, yeah, so a kind of intentional vagueness. Yeah. But, and so object has that kind of quality to it. But then also there's this sense that we have now, very urgently, 
that the world is full and every object is an additional burden. Mm -hmm. So I know like that you mean environmentally, environmentally yeah. particularly, um, but also in terms of the commodity spectrum mm -hmm. and sort of who wins and loses when every object is brought into being. Mm -hmm. And I know Tanya, that's a really a present concern for you and a lot of your work. So I, I was wondering if you might talk about the object from that ethical point of view in a way that might be might not have been so much in people's minds at the at the time. Yeah. Um, so for me. There was a lot, it was really difficult to even go into making objects and even to go into um, like, well, just anything artistic. And so then I landed in like furniture and like functional art because I had, I was too guilty. I had too much like class guilt of what does it mean to labor on something and then in the end have it be something that's for a luxury market. Um, so that's kind of how I started, um, yeah, like learning about like functional art and getting involved in it. Um, and it really wasn't until I had a child um, that I started allowing myself to make things that were non-functional. Um, just because I started thinking about, you know, what it means to birth another woman um, and what it means to have a practice that has, that is part of a legacy. Um, and so in school, um, undergraduate and grad school, we were always really aware of like who our professors studied under and this larger uh, legacy that we were now becoming a part of um, through craft and through working with our hands. Um, and after having a child, I started thinking more about like what type of doors am I opening for this person to be whatever they want to be. Um, and so a lot of the issues of identity and a lot of the issues of um, of like politics and all and, and everything is just um, like ways to to push the discipline of craft forward, um, but also a way to leave behind a better world. And particularly when you've uh, given birth to a person who's going to have a forward trajectory into that hopefully better world, into yeah. that future. Can you say a little bit more about the class guilt thing? That yeah. sounds that's a really interesting <laughs> phrase to use about your own work. Yeah. Uh, can you just say um, more about that? Yeah, so um, like I said, I grew up in Tijuana, which is in Mexico on the border. Um, and I crossed the border every day to go to school in San Diego, which means I would leave the house at 3.30 in the morning to be at school by 8 a.m. Um, and this was, I was in public school, so I had to use fake addresses to be able to stay in the U.S. going to school. Um, and all of this is just because you can have a better life if you get paid in dollars, but you spend it where things are cheaper. Um, so there's like, I think it's 10.5 like million of us just in the region of San Diego and Tijuana that do the crossing back and forth um, every day. So my parents did it for 40 years and then I did it for 14 years. Um, and so my dad was a ship grinder. So uh, he worked on battleships and he would get hoisted over the battleships with a 40 pound grinder stuck to his body and he would have to grind the welds down on the boats with his body. Um, so there's so much labor and so much sacrifice involved in me being able to just go to school in the United States um, and to have like the luxury of having a choice to decide what type of career I want, um, which was something that like my, my father didn't have. You know, he had to just do whatever he could do for money um, because he dropped out of school in eighth grade. Um, and so there's all of this different just like levels of like class, um, gender, my parents um, never had a boy and really wanted a boy. There's all, you know, all these different layers of like stuff that gets put upon you, especially when you're the oldest. Um, and so I was always very artistic, but would not allow myself to do anything artistic um, in terms of career choices. One, because I never saw myself mirrored in any careers that were out there. I never visited a museum. I never had art classes. Um, and it wasn't until I went into a museum to apply for a job that I'd ever actually gone into a museum. Um, and so, yeah, so it's just, you know, like growing up like poor and brown in another country and you're kind of constantly trying to figure out like how do you actually make a living in the US. Um, and so you never really think about um, like how do you do something that's fulfilling? How do you do something that's sustainable? Um, you're just kind of trying to just, just survive, you know? 
and it, it's such a tragic example of the way that people who are um, in a situation of poverty then have their time wasted yeah. because you think of the, I mean, do that calculation, all those people having to spend four hours a day just crossing the border, getting absolutely nothing done for anybody, including yeah. themselves. Yeah. And of course, that's, you know, that's like a tax on their own poverty, yeah. essentially. Um, uh, it, so this brings us, I suppose, um, to the question of America, mm -hmm. question mark. And um, I was really fortunate enough to go to this event last night, um, speaking of the moon shot. Of course, it's also the 50th anniversary of that. And Michael Collins was speaking, and he was the guy who wasn't Buzz Aldrin or Neil Armstrong, who was up in the spaceship looking down at the moon and didn't actually get to step on it. Uh, but he was there, and he said something so amazing, which was that, and this may be a familiar, a familiar thought to you, but I think worth uh, repeating, that when he was up there looking at the Earth from that distance, he was just so struck by the fact that A, it looked very fragile, and B, it, it, you, the idea that it would be made up of separate countries just seemed a total absurdity. The way he described it was that the continents themselves looked like stains of rust on this tiny object. And he said that he felt like if he had only been able to bring up all the world leaders on that spacecraft, it would have ended war. This incredible idea, um, kind of space, based utopianism. Um, but it, it really, I think, forces your attention on the artificiality and foolishness of border making, especially wall making, which is obviously something we're dealing with in a very present way, politically in this country, but not only in this country at the moment. So how do you both think the concept of an exhibition about Americanness, as Paul said, it was very much received that way abroad as well, like, oh, it's surprising in some ways, but in some ways it also seems very American, you know, all this California funk counterculture energy um, was in it as well, uh, although perhaps America was not necessarily associated with craft. So how does that feel from a distance of 50 years? And if we were thinking about the relationship between craft and America now, what story might we, might we want to tell differently? It's, it's such a good question, and it's again this. I'm uh, fascinated by that this time period, the 1969 to 2019, the way in which that also brackets um, the beginning of globalization. And if we think about, try to kind of find ways to compare and contrast then and now, what are the things that are, that are the same, and what are the things that are drastically different? Is that um, the sort of non-college educated middle class, working class, has been, as people like to say, hollowed out. Um, but goods are cheap because they're made somewhere else. So that wage stagnation and that hollowed outness is hurting people. But the reason that there aren't sort of riots in the streets about it is because things are, so, are still so affordable. In real terms, things are much, you know, you would have paid $400 for a Zenith television in 1955, and you'll pay half that in $2019 in, uh, in 2019. Um, and so your television will be five times bigger. Exactly, right. We'll be totally flat and gorgeous and you can play, right, exactly. Uh, you can play games on it. Um, so I think that there's the notion of like an object from the USA has totally changed because it's relatively rare to find something that's made here. And if you want to do that, it usually means, if it's a consumer product, it probably means making, uh, spending a little bit more money. Um, it might mean, um, you know, thinking about sort of the environmental cost. The um, I remember, I think actually you have mentioned um, that there's the naturalist fallacy that if things are kind of natural, they're safer. That notion that if things have chemicals, even though the entire world is made from chemicals, it's if things have chemicals, they're bad. And that there's this notion sometimes about things like firing pottery in an onagama kiln or making glass by hand that somehow um, you know, better, it's more pure, when in fact, because there's no economy of scale, it's terribly wasteful. It's like incredibly inefficient and it's not good for the environment. So there's an idea that it's kind of crafty and crunchy, but that's kind of a, an aesthetic rather than um, a real sort of brass tacks analysis of, of how things are made. Yeah, it's kind of a haunting idea that the craft movement was the original greenwashing. I hate to say it, yeah. I hate to say it, but I think that's not, off the, off the mark. Obviously not in any intentional sense. No, def I mean, I think very much in, a, in a, a utopian way. I mean, I think you were talking about, you know, moon, sort of moonshot utopia, that this was the era of communes and, you know, I'm gonna leave the city and start new and, you know, there's, um, everything is so divided here. 
Um, that sounds familiar in 2019. Um, so I think, yeah, that definitely is. And what do you think about the question of geography? So if we're mm -hmm. thinking about um, America as the scope mm -hmm. of thinking about craft, which I, I think um, maybe has already been implied by what we've said, but that doesn't seem to be the instinct these days. The instinct mm -hmm. is much more towards the global and mm -hmm. towards connectivity. Um, so that's one issue. And then, as Roseanne said, there was all this regional contrast, and still is regional contrast, in yeah. the craft um, scenes of America at that time that, um, if anything, people seem to be more interested in, like the mm -hmm. Appalachian-ness of the Appalachian story of Penland, for example, or the Southern Highland Guild, or the Californianness of those woodworkers and, and potters. Because it's also craft as lifestyle. But I think also in, in the time since then and now, there's, there's you know, um, a ghetto potter. Right there's we have an urban aesthetic, um, kind of a, an African American or a Latin Latinx is that how it's pronounced Latinx um, aesthetic, and that's embraced and celebrated as it should be, in very prestigious institutional context. It's kind of hard to imagine that happening in 1969. Yeah. Um. <laughs> Although, as, as Janet rightly said, Objects USA is astonishingly inclusive. That's true. That in retrospect, it's for true. Its time. Yeah. Um, I think even now it probably is much mm. more inclusive than. A lot and of some, art shows yeah. that happen in big museums of that scale, mm -hmm. um, not just in terms of gender, but also in terms of ethnicity. In terms of so, ethnicity, yeah. So Paul and Lee deserve a lot of credit for that farsightedness. Yeah. Um, Tanya, what yeah. do you think about this issue? I mean, these questions about borders and Americanness are so fundamental to your work and life, but can you try to uh, sort of condense your feeling about it, again, thinking about what's happened in the last 50 years? Um, yeah, I think for me, um, even like looking at Objects USA and thinking about like how I think about the United States, like it's so, like everything's constantly like from like the like lower 48 view. Um, like there's a lot of, so I've spent tons of time working with um, Native Alaskan artists and stuff and um, uh, Barry, who's in the audience and I, uh, for Wood Surf, um, just came back from Puerto Rico and got to know a lot about like their identity issues and how, um, yeah, the US has controlled like the way that they see themselves. Um, and so I think about, um, like in general, I think that the craft scene has maintained this like exclusivity of it being still pretty like white, like Anglo dominant, like Western looking, um, where things are like very like, like looking towards Europe very colonial, like a lot of col like colonial settler mentality approach to stuff. Um, and so I feel like um, it's an issue that I had brought up during um, one of the craft council um, uh, conferences um, that for the most part, those of us that are like outsiders, so people that are like people of color, people that are, um, that are native, we get brought in um, when there's public programs, but we don't, usually get collected by museums, exhibited by museums at the same level that even a white woman would. Um, so it's um, it's still, like I think that there's a lot of issues that we're working through with craft. I think that craft has given us, um, like the people in my generation and the people in the ge generation that I teach, um, it's given, craft has given us a lot of ways to subvert these conversations and, um, and like even like if you think about Objects USA, like it's not queer at all. And craft now is very queer. Um, there's like so many different things that um, just, yeah, like with identity and, and um, lack of representation for otherness um, outside of just lifestyle um, that is now happening. And would you say that a lot of those values, like queerness would be a really good example, these uh, values that we're now being encouraged to think of as intersectional as well, yeah. do you think that they're also implicitly or inherently transnational? Yeah. That would be my instinct as well. Yeah. Because it, it seems to me like, um, just philosophically, if you embrace queerness as a craft value, mm -hmm. that doesn't really feel like something that should be embedded in a, in a nation's story. It feels mo like a more human value. Mm -hmm. And so this idea that a, that a boundary is like a knife cut through humanity, mm -hmm. right, that seems that seems very allied to a lot of the currents that I feel are happening in craft at the moment. Um, can I just shift the conversation to another question where maybe these two things about 
the object value and the nation value intersect, which is in this uh, in the area that Paul al alluded to, which is about soft power mm -hmm. and the degree to which Objects USA was in fact, um, and I don't mean this critically, but it was just factually speaking a corporate branding exercise. And then it was also very much embraced by the American government um, and American media, like the Today Show and Barbara Walters, as something to hold up as an exemplar of what America could do and maybe should do more of. Um, which make, again makes you think of the space program, which is also used in that kind of diplomatic way. Um, and also makes me think a little bit about another joint anniversary that we're celebrating this year, which is 100 years of the 19th Amendment, so suffrage for women. Great show upstairs on the first floor about that, by the way, if you have time to see it. And also, I think there's been less said about this, maybe because the chronology is a little less fixed, but it's also probably the 100th anniversary of the Harlem Renaissance this year, because it's often thought to have started when the returning um, the 369th Infantry uh, marched through Harlem, and it was an all-black unit. It was a segregated unit. And so that's, that's often thought to have ignited the sense of neighborhood pride that became the Harlem Renaissance. And one interesting thing to me about that joint anniversary is that the Harlem Renaissance was actually quite sexist, and the suffragette movement was quite racist. <laughs> so you have, if we're thinking about intersectionality, and how it power. Wasn't their strong suit, intersectionality. <laughs> well, and you can understand why, because of course, writers like um, Richard Wright or James Weldon Johnson, artists like Aaron Douglas, uh, black jazz musicians, they were aspiring to a level of um, acceptance and, you know, authority that had previously been withheld from African Americans. And so they felt like they had enough on their plate. And similarly, the white suffragettes thought, well, we can't fight two civil rights movements at once, so you know why make our jobs any harder? And it's a fair question, why should a minority feel like they have to fight for another minority when the rest of the culture isn't? Why is that their problem? That's obviously a deep philosophical, ethical question. Um, but to get back to the topic at hand, I feel like there's a whole set of issues there when you start thinking about intersectionality versus um, demographic sectors that um, soft power can often try to cover up through these semi-mythological narratives around Americans all being one, you know, e pluribus unum and all that. And so those seem like really, really raw, difficult issues that we're all working through at the moment. And I wonder what, in a general sense, you all, th what you both think craft can do in that situation where we are being encouraged so much to think about identity politics where it does feel very divisive and oppositional at times. Do you have a sense of optimism about craft's role in that kind of a context, Tanya, do you? Yeah, I definitely do. Um, and I mean, I, I kind of don't have a choice but to, um, because it's what I do for a living, so. Um, but I feel like within like the community of others, um, like within, again, like the, like, like the POC community, like people of color, um, and like native and indigenous community, and like within the queer community, um, we're all constantly looking for ways to collaborate and to help each other. Um, so that, you know, you kind of like constantly think about like we're all in this together, like we're all like in this country or on this world together, like let's share resources, let's figure out ways um, that we can piggyback on stuff. Um, and so within that, there's a lot of hope. Um, and I think, and again, like seeing yourself mirrored in other like positions of power and in um, knowing that the burden of making this place better is it just on your shoulders. Um, and so I think that's, that, that's one thing that is constantly happening like in craft because we're constantly having to like re like brand craft um, just because the way of making a living through craft is constantly changing. Um, like, you know, when we were students, there was like actual like studio, like galleries that people made money off of. Um, and then with the internet, all of a sudden, like a bunch of people were making money on like Etsy. And then, you know, there's so many different things that are constantly happening because of technology um, that I think within that we're kind of trying to find what's the stable ground. Um, that we can, like, together, like, help each other through. Yeah, it's interesting that um, Kraft also has had this real um, 
a, a very significant role in activism in the last few years, and the most famous example is the pussy hat, which of course itself has been critiqued from a ethnic point of view, it's like why are they all pink, you know, um, which seems to involve a kind of white normativity. Um, but having said that, it seems to me anyway that craft often in what you might call a crowdsourcing context is a way of encouraging a level of commitment and involvement that an online crowdsourcing function, which is just a matter of pressing a button, just can't do. And even when you think about a protest march where all the banners are handmade, you know, like the protest banner lending library is a great example of this, um, led by Aramhan and Cifuentes, um, where people are encouraged to get together and, you know, actually forge the tools of their own political sentiment. Um, that that does seem to have an ongoing relevance in the 21st century. And that again is a very, it's, it doesn't feel like it's the kind of object that was an object's USA because, you know, the pussy hat is not an object. It's a format, it's an idea, it's a proposition. Um, well, and the other thing you're, you're getting to is the vernacular, which is sort of sometimes the thing we don't want to address in, in this craft context because the battle that Objects USA was fighting was partly about getting this kind of material into museums and galleries in a prestigious setting and intersectional in its own kind of way. Like, we're as good, you know, encyclopedic museums are full of tapestries and carpets from hundreds of years ago. This can be there, Lenore Tani can be there. And having to fight so hard, understandably, for that legitimacy that somebody who's, you know, kind of a, a, a Sunday knitter, if that's a thing, knitting a pussy hat, um, you don't want to be lumped in necessarily with that person because you've studied and worked and perfected your, your skills. So I think that relationship is kind of a superpower and a curse that craft has because it's something that I've noticed when I write about something craft related in a very mainstream publication that's not arts focused or, or craft related at all is, um, you know, still feedback about its, its irrelevance or its, its sort of association with the hobby industry and that sort of thing. And I think one exhibition as an example to point out, um, which you should see if you're in Philly before mid-August because it closes soon, is um, Monumental Cloth, The Flag You Should Know, which is at the Fabric Workshop and Museum in Philadelphia now by Sonia Clark. And it is inspired actually by an artifact that is in the Smithsonian. And it's the um, tea towel, it is literally a dish towel, like a waffle weave dish towel that was used uh, for lack of any other white textile at Appomattox to signal surrender. And her kind of thought experiment for this project is, you know, what if that was the symbol we all knew? What if that was the symbol that we associated with, with the Confederacy? Yeah. And instead of the Confederate battle flag. Right, instead of that, which is the one, unfortunately, that every, and she does, there's an amazing piece that's all text, that's a list of objects you can buy with that emblazoned on it, all of whom are probably made in China, one of which includes like a yoga mat. I mean, it's the craziest thing, but it's fascinating. And it's a tea towel. Everybody can relate to that. So I think looking at a, a project like that is brilliant because it's conceptual, it's very sophisticated, it's complicated. Weaving is very complicated, but it's not hard to understand how amazing it is that that's where this artifact came from and that it, it absorbs things. So it's metaphorically very rich. I love what you said about Kraft's vernacular basis being both a curse and a superpower. It is. Which is actually yeah. very related to what you said about class guilt. And, um, you know, there's a couple of things that occur to me about that. One is that, um, one is that uh, the economic basis of craft, if you sort of think where is the money in craft, you know, it's not coming from Johnson Wax, it's actually in the hobby industry, right? It's, it's Michael's. It's Michael's, yeah. right? That's where most of the money is. It's, it's, the, it's the glitter library. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then the other, um, the other thing that occurs to me is that the only moment of critique of, of Objects USA all afternoon has been when Janet put up that picture of the Alma Lesh, right, and said, well, this doesn't seem to belong in Objects USA, which I think it's right. It seems like it a looks real, like a state fair. Like a false note. And it's fascinating yeah. that state fair was the pejorative, right. like of all possible right, content. Right, right, I don't right. mean to put you on the spot, but it's just right. super interesting. But I think that's right as a reading of what Objects USA was trying to achieve, because as and you to say, avoid. it's yeah. holding amateurism at bay. But it just shows you that craft was not then and is not now and never will be divorced from all these issues of um, status and power. You know, we all live in that all the time. So, okay, I've just been giving the stop sign. So, that's all from us, and we're gonna have our Q and A now. Thank you, Tanya. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Thank you.
Every, yes, um, it's all of the speakers. If you could um, send up your comment cards in the aisles, Ryan, um, our program staffer, will help collect those. And um, so Paul and Roseanne and Janet, I invite you back up. I will have chairs and microphones for you. You want me to move over there? No, you're right there. You're good. This just has to be. Thank you all so much. Um, I feel like I could have listened to that conversation for the rest of the afternoon. Am I on? It would help if I turned it on, wouldn't it? There we go. Um, I was just saying, I feel like I could have listened to that conversation for the rest of the afternoon. Hopefully, we'll get some more insights, and then we can continue our conversations in the lobby afterward. Um, I wanted to get started with um, this one. We've seen many of the same objects, Peter Volkus's cross, Arlene Fish's body ornament, a personal favorite. Um, in all of the PowerPoints. What about these works, um, objects, works, still have such power and resonance today? That's for anyone. I mean, the Arlene Fish, I think it's, it's just so unusual. And I think because it's made to wear, there's something about it that I almost feel like if you wore that now, you would be the queen of Brooklyn and it would be the coolest thing. And it would people, you know, it, it's so, singular and so original and not that the other works are, are not that but I think that it stands out in its its kind of wonderful oddity and that that for me that it stands out as one of the the hallmark pieces I always wondered how you sit down when you wear oh. that. <laughs> you don't uh, you stand regally yes uh, I, I feel like I have to say something about Volkus because I was involved with this exhibition called Volkus the Breakthrough Years that traveled to the Renwick uh, a couple of years ago. And, you know, in some ways Volkus in retrospect feels like kind of a problematic figure because he was so, partly by design and partly because of the way that he was received, he was such an alpha male and so macho and he was kind of treated as you know, the Marlon Brando of ceramics, something like that. And, and I, I, all of that I really wanted to shed in working on that show. Um, but there is no doubt that what happened there was that you had this rupture in the fabric of ceramic history um, that seemed like a model for so many other people working in so many other media, as you said, Roseanne. But I would point out that it was also done by people like Lenore Tani and by people like Art Smith and jewelry. So it, it wasn't, I think there was a unique thing that happened in craft where um, yes, white men had the opportunity to have that kind of an impact, but not only white men. And I think craft was almost uniquely porous to that kind of diversity. Yeah, I, I would also say that one reason uh, objects or images retain their power is that we see them again and again um, and it's, it's because Objects USA was this kind of model that it's drawn on to illustrate other things. So then you see that again, and so it becomes imprinted on your brain as something that was important and remains important. Um, this is about kind of uh, the continuation of the craft movement. Has it gone from a rejection of the manufactured work made by one person for the satisfaction back to it, albeit somewhat small, manufactured where if so, is that good and inevitable? If not, where are the current craftsmen working? So I'll, I'll start that one, because um, I'm around so many of the um, artists who are working now. And um, 
I don't think it's so much a, a, an issue of um, production or not. I, I think that artists today use every material, including coding. I mean, co we teach coding now along with um, charcoal drawing, separate classes, but I mean, they're all materials for artists to use. And um, I, I think more the issue is um, something that was alluded to in the panel is about the notion of practice, and practice in the sense of having a practice. So the difference between a kind of hobby view of knitting a, a pussy hat and the idea of someone who, like some of the people in the show, worked in the studio in a medium for 100 years or, you know, it's 60 or 70 years. And with any kind of um, art or writing or any kind of practice, there's a certain kind of expertise that comes out of that kind of commitment to a practice, regardless of the material, the techniques, that's different than um, a dabbler. And so I, I think with the, for what I'm more interested in is in understanding the notion of not so much the process, the production, or the materials, but actually the commitment to a medium or to an art practice and how that reflects in works that have a long-lasting um, impact. There are exceptions, of course, that you can always find. But over time, um, for me, in watching a lot of younger artists start and then become you know, successful artists. It's those who, who don't have a choice. They're just committed to what they do because that's their metier, that's how they have to speak. There was this wonderful, I don't know if it, you remember the movie Il Postino, which was a film and uh, about a young poet who's trying to, who's a mailman, is trying to learn how to write poetry to someone he loves and he delivers mail to Neruda. And he asks Maru Neruda how, um, why he uses poetry to say what he's trying to say. And he said, if there was any other language, I'd use that. You know, and I, so I look at artists' um, practice as a way of evolving a relationship with ideas that develops over time. And to me, that's another definition of craft. I feel like that's an excellent one. Um, you touched on this um, a little bit in your answer just now, and, but we can also, you don't have to answer, we can open it up to everyone. What about 3D printer construction and computer design as craft? Can there be some sense of universal beauty involved with craft rather than identity? And I'm sorry, I can't read your some artistic message. Well, There's new technology is being used already. I mean, 3D printing and you know, a lot of people design on a computer. And what is also interesting historically is that the Jacquard loom was the predecessor to the computer. <laughs> and the computer is now the vehicle for designing textile. So you have to be open to incorporate all of these, these things. And it was very interesting to me this week in relation to this big event that uh, uh, Apollo uh, landing on the moon, uh, that uh, the, um, so there were two uh, programs where three women who uh, hand sewed and made the spacesuit. I was so fascinated with that because I, and they were interviewed about the extensive technology uh, or requirements of that suit and turn, and it, but the fact it was hand sewn, hand made, <laughs> and, and I, it wasn't included in Objects USA. <laughs> but one has to be open, I think, to all these different things. I mean, I, I, I think that uh, 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 there's always going to be something uh, new. And uh, uh, but I think just one comment, maybe not in relation to this, is that thinking back to that the 60s era, um, uh, it, it was very, uh, so much of what was happening, there was such a cultural change motivated by young people. Uh, and and their, their energy, anything was possible. And something like the landing on the moon symbolizes that to one extreme, but also all the kind of things that were coming about and, you know, the what people wore, the hand-dyed t-shirts and the decorated jeans, were saying, this is me. <laughs> so it, it, there was, there's a whole kind of cultural connection as well as a technological connection 
that's involved with all these things we do. And it's not just with the craft field, but it's with, with all the arts and music and you know, whatever. But uh. What is the vision for the future of Objects USA, capturing creativity from diverse communities? Oh, can I put in my plug now? Because I've been looking for a chance to do that. Um, so Tanya and 99 other artists are going to be in an exhibition that we're doing next year in New York City at r and Company Gallery, which, by the way, is run by two graduates of RISD, Evan Snyderman and Zesty Myers. And what we're doing is a show that has 50 artists from the original exhibition and 50 artists working today. And it's going to be at both of the locations in the um, gallery. So we're doing it for the 50th anniversary of the book, Objects USA, coming out, which came out in 1970. Um, so that's going to be in the fall of 2020. So that's one future of Objects USA. But I just want to say it was amazingly difficult to choose only 50 artists from the original show, which shows you how great that exhibition was, because I think there was something like 150 some artists in the show. And even narrowing it down to a third of them at a distance of 50 years was incredibly difficult. So that's a, just my little plug. But maybe there's something more to say about the future of objects. I would also comment that um, I'm, uh, it's amazing how, as the word has gotten around, this has become uh, much bigger than I would have ever expected. <laughs> and um, I uh, uh, personally have been nurturing archival uh, uh, expansion. And uh, the American Crafts uh, Council has uh, a very good file. And I'm working with a librarian to recommend that they digitize more material. I've been in touch with the archivist at Johnston Wax, who a few years ago did, uh, I worked with her and we did an inventory of where all of the works are in museums, because that was an unknown factor. And, and everybody was frustrated because we didn't know where things were. That's just been updated, and I'm going to try to get that digitized and online for reference, because that's really important to know. Some museums have two works, some have five works, and, uh, and also the uh, MAD, which has the largest uh, collection, that is, has been is already online, and, uh, and we did some refinement on that. So I have been, uh, and I have uh, some ideas about here, <laughs> the material that could be more focused. Uh, so, and uh, uh, as you know, the, uh, may know the Racine Art Museum is doing a, a whole exhibition and the Houston Center for Craft and Design is planning something. And there's going to be a panel at the ACC conference in Philadelphia. So it, it keeps building and, and I think that that's very good. But, to me, the important thing ultimately is try to get some of this material into uh, a resource. The book is fabulous, uh, as everybody agrees, but I, there's also a lot of support material. I mean, I have uh, um, documents such, such as uh, Sam Johnson's uh, remarks at the opening, you know, and Dylan Ripley's uh, remarks and those kinds of things which are in the ACC file. So do you think that the archivists for the uh, Johnson's Wax Company would know how much money they put into it? That's an unknown factor, and I, I was never involved with all the financial ends, but I do have the insurance value of the European tour itemized by objects in my own archive. And it was $217,000. Uh, now, if you think of the amount of artists, and you look at the individual breakouts, there were pieces that valued at $100 and $300 and uh, hardly anything that was two or 3,000. I mean, it was, it, you know, of course it was a different economy at that time, but there's no, when you think of something like the Volcus Cross that I think was purchased for $500 from Lenore Tawney because it came from her collection. Uh, I don't know if you know that. And, and, and uh, can you imagine, <laughs> imagine what the value of this would be today? <laughs> Lee Nordness's papers are also at the Archives of American Art, and he has some great accounting in there, um, and those are being digitized well, as well. Yeah, so. Lee, one of the things that is great is that uh, there's uh, 77 feet of papers that, uh, that Lee donated to the Archives of American Art, but there, it's about his gallery and about everything else. But I was just amazed about uh, uh, six weeks ago, I was searching, 
and the archives has actually done an, a digitized inventory. I printed it out, it's a quarter inch thick, and lists every letter, every contact. But it's, the problem is, like with the archives here, uh, is that they're mixed in with Renwick and all kinds of things. That, that material needs to be brought together under Objects USA, so you could go in and get it all at once. <laughs> it needs to be, uh, and I'm, I'm going to try to nurture that. By the way, that. the letters are fabulous. And just um, to quote one, he, Lenore Tawney was initially intending to do this amazing, huge woven cube that would have been kind of like a minimalist, like a Donald Judd of fabric. And it's, it, the prototype is in the book, but she didn't actually, she wasn't able to right. technically achieve it. But Nordness wrote her a letter just a couple of months before the opening that said, Dear Lenore, I'm sure your artwork will be fabulous, but if it's going to be in this show, it had better be fabulous soon. <laughs> he was a very smart man, um, also very quippy. We only have about five more minutes. Um, Paul, this one is for you. Uh, why was the Almalesh piece selected, and how do you feel about the criticism of its inclusion? Well, everybody has a right to opinions. <laughs> 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 I happen to uh, have liked her work at the time. I mean, uh, I think uh, one of the things I really didn't say uh, was that uh, uh, a lot of, there were many artists that could and should have been in, but there comes a point and, and, that, and that, that this was not the definitive selection and that a lot of times I think the selection was to, to portray a uh, a uh, creative expression that was different from anything else. We didn't want to have all the works looking alike. And in the textile area, this, her collage with found materials was interesting. Marilyn Pappas was doing something different with a, with a coat and embroidery on it. So we were looking at the kind of uh, breadth of visual expressions and that, that uh, obviously we were picking works that we would, thought would hold up at the time. Uh, and. Um, it's maybe a little prejudice on my part, but I'm, I'm amazed that when you look at some of these works, how uh, fresh they look. They don't look uh, antiquated, you know? Do you agree with me on that? I absolutely do, and I was uh, going to add that I think in terms of the future, going back to your previous question, is that um, you know, if you interact with people who are in their early 20s in college, studying craft, teaching as, you know, in whatever way, um, young people love that time period. I, when I was teaching history of design, when I first started freelancing, I had to assign decades to the class, and everybody had their little hand raised for World War II and the decade that followed. And these are, you know, 19-year-olds who are, do not remember existence prior to smartphones mm -hmm. or sort of having constant data. And so, Speaking their language, having a digital archive of Objects USA, how much did it cost? How did it work? Who did it? What are all the images? You know, what's the press coverage? What did that mean before the internet to be, to be on the Today Show? Is that's the language that 19-year-olds speak? I'm not, I don't mean to pick on 19-year-olds, but um, that I think sharing that information in the language that they speak is crucial because they have a real appetite for it. Well, I find that history takes time to come into place. <laughs> and having been part of history now, I, weekly, I get inquiries from somebody, not only in America, but all over the world, about an artist or something, and I have to, I dig up and have material, and, but I'm a, a, what is interesting is an enormous amount of passion among some of these young people who got very excited about, I have one from a, a Parisian who is doing a whole thing on photo media and is doing a whole study on, on that show, and, and I can't, I've had about 10 long phone calls and, and uh, conversations with her over that, and, and uh, it never ends. I mean, she's still writing her paper. So the fact that, but the, what is interesting is the fact that the, uh, a generation of, of that distance is suddenly being very interested in mid 20th century history. And I applaud mid 20th century history because I think so much happened at that point, and I think we're gonna find not, not the show, but um, uh, the, that whole uh, activity that took place having increasing historical importance like the arts and crafts movies or Art Nouveau or whatever. Whatever it's going to be called, I don't know. But I, I think it's going to have an increased interest because so much interesting work happened 
in the whatever you want to call it category, but it, it, it really is something that what I'm really speaking to the fact that history takes time to come into focus, and then you begin to see it in the context of, of another uh, landscape, such as this event today. And I think, uh, oh, sorry, oh, just real quick. Um, yeah, so I got into making furniture because I lived on top of a mid-century furniture store, um, and me and my friends would just find all of these old books like at the thrift store, and it felt like a recipe for the future. It felt so hopeful and so empowering um, just to know that you could look at anything that was made by humans that looked like, I don't know, like machine made or whatever, and that you really could just take that and make it your own. And I think that's so much of the power of um, the objects in the book too, is that they're all so innovative um, that it makes you feel like anything is possible. I was going to say something, and that's actually a good lead-in about the way that um, this younger generation consumes things, and there's a great difference um, in ownership. You know, that people don't own cars anymore; they use Uber. They don't even own apartments or buy houses. There are all these transient ways of living now that are very attractive for many reasons to a younger generation, but they do consume books, and book, the, the, the incidence of book publishing has gone way up. They also um, visit museums in, in large numbers. So it's interesting to think about this legacy carrying on in other ways, because it is wonderful to have the books and the archives and the materials, but it's also important to experience objects in person. And But I don't think that this generation, it, uh, there are not young collectors in droves, you know, forming. They really w want to see things and not own them and not maintain them and not, you know, conserve them. So it's an interesting thing, I think, to think about the future legacy of objects in terms of those conditions. As a young person, we don't have the money. But that's a different <laughs> conversation and a different symposium. Um, thank you all so much for this wonderful panel, for all of your presentations today. This has been really special for me um, and really exciting. Thank you all so much for coming. Um, please let's go have some wine in the lobby and continue to talk about Objects USA and what the future looks like for collecting and objects and craft. <laughs>